Hey, Trevor Matthews here with uh, Morning Coffees with Trevor, day number two. Uh, yesterday was a super successful day. I had some questions, we shared some knowledge, and I thought it was real good that we had the opportunity to uh, really learn from each other. And hopefully we continue to do that again. Aaron, Morning, how are you doing? I fixed my camera. Oh, fantastic. I like the gauges set up in the back behind you. Yeah, just hanging out here in the room. Yeah, that's all good. Yesterday, we, we uh, had some good conversation about contamination and got into uh, some oil, right? So mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty good. I thought about it afterwards. There was a few things that I, I we didn't get into talking about non-condensables uh, and, you know, pulling down evacuations below uh, 500, and doing standstill tests. But uh, it's always important that uh, the listeners, you know, if you're doing a new installation is follow the, the manufacturer guidelines right it's pretty important to do that what are you up to this morning what you got going on today Aaron we have um uh, Thursdays are our lab day like all day lab so it's exciting like a work day but one of our main employers is coming in to uh they're actually sending a tech to start to clean and go through our whole ice machine in the food court as a class presentation so we're cool. all going to get together, both classes have breakfast, and, we'll, and they're going to demonstrate the full ice machine service for us. Wow, that, that's awesome. That, and that's kind of, that's really good for the students, for sure, because now you have an expert coming in and kind of going through the steps on how to do it, you know, and the proper way to do it. I worked on quite a few ice machines, and they can be intimidating, especially when you're working on, if you're working on package units before, or even like I was working on a lot of rack system, parallel rack system or market systems. And then when you get onto a, a Manitowoc or another type of ice machine and you never seen it before, there's just different uniqueness. You really need to understand like the harvesting cycles. You need to understand the, uh, how long it runs in uh, cooling mode or freezing mode. And it's, uh, it's something that you learn over time, but you sometimes need the manual and it's specific ways to clean it, right? You need different, chemicals uh, you know to get that scale off and so i think that's going to be a fantastic uh presentation for your students yeah we try to get visitors and other presenters as much as we can they can only listen to me so long yeah no no and that's fair and it gives you an opportunity to learn as well you know what i mean i i learn every every day even yesterday in the first uh morning coffee with trevor is i learned a lot just having a conversation with you and the other uh techs out there and and that's what it's all about is sharing knowledge, sharing experience, because my experience, we could go out and work on the same piece of equipment, but my experience working on it's going to be different than yours. And that's, that's the way I talk to with a lot of the apprentices and the technicians is just, even though you might only be one, two, three, or four years into the industry, your experience is going to be different than even the guy that has 10 years experience. And if you can share that knowledge and and kind of get an understanding of how both of you do it, because there's not always in refrigeration what the wild thing is there's not one way to do um, everything. You know what I mean? It's not here. This is how you do it. You can do it multiple ways. Some ways are better than others. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but for sure, there's multiple ways that you can, you can do stuff and people have their own ways where they do it. And there's other ways that are a bit more correct. Um, you know, at the end of the day, if you're following the uh, manufactured guidelines, if you're following codes uh, and you're working safely, you know, uh, and making sure at the end you do all the proper testing when you install a piece of equipment, that'll make it, you know, then you're, you're sure and do the startup sheets. That's a, one of the big things, make sure you do startup sheets, but that'll definitely help uh, with that equipment lasting a lot longer in the field. Today, uh, I'm going to try, I'm going to talk a bit more about mechanical failure system issues. We're going to get into overheat today and uh, overheat is probably one of the leading issues in systems and which lead to compressor failures. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what compressor manufacturer is overheat. It definitely used to be, especially on low temp was uh, the biggest uh, culprit of failed and issues with compressor, especially low temp R22. I've worked on a ton of it. You'd all, I'd always come into a, a rack room and I'd look and the sight glasses would be brown or black. And I, at first I didn't understand, I did definitely didn't understand for the first three or four or five years in the industry, even maybe longer of what really you needed to do, like 
talking about compression ratio. I heard about compression ratio when I was in, in school, but I never did it in the field as a technician. And I haven't really even done it until I started really, um, you know, doing field support for technicians out there. Uh, for the years that I worked with uh, with Copeland. And when I was doing field support, I, I noticed it more and more that it's very important with the compressors to have the right compression ratio. When you have co more compression ratio, you have more heat. It does more work. And then you get if you get outside those operation envelopes of any compressor manufacturer's compressor, uh, it's going to lead to a failure. So it's super important to find out what the operation envelope is of that compressor. And all the leading compressor manufacturers, you can find that information on their websites or on their apps. And I highly recommend anyone who is looking for that to look it up. Oh, yeah, that's good. I love my coffee in the morning. Like it's, uh, I, have, I have quite a few a day too. Like my wife bought a, a specialty coffee machine a few years ago, a refurbished one. And, um, you know, for the first few years, I didn't use it a lot. Uh, but definitely since uh, the before the pandemic, I guess we started using it a bit and we'd make uh, uh, lattes and stuff. But I'm really into my favorite drink now is Americano. So it's a shot of espresso and then hot water in it and you fill it up. And fantastic for me. That's my favorite drink. I used to, here in Canada, I used to drink a lot because as a technician, you're on the road a lot and, you know, you're working on calls and you're working a 14 or 16 hour days sometimes, or you're working night shifts. I've done that so many times, like working months and months of nights and, you know, doing a construction job. And my go-to was either Tim Hortons and I used to get double doubles back in the day. Oh, look there, there, Greg. Hey, Greg, good morning, buddy. <laughs> He's got one in his hand. <clears throat> And uh, so that was my go-to. And then, you know, McDonald's came out with their coffees and I had those. But now it's, uh, it's I, I, I can't, to be honest, I, I drink them if I need to, but I'm not, I always go to my Americanos. Like it's a uh, different flavor, different taste, you know, just to even busting up the, the coffee beans themselves. And it takes a while to make <laughs> these specialty coffees, but I definitely enjoy it. We have a percolator in him, old-fashioned percolator. Boy, is that good coffee. Yeah, there you go. There you go. It's perfect. Whatever whatever works for you, uh, <laughs> that is that is exactly what you need to do. Greg, what's happened out on the East Coast this morning? Oh, you're on mute. There, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. How are you doing? Yeah. I'm doing well. I... I, I... I've been feeling guilty because I know you've been doing a lot of great initiatives and I, I tried to make my schedule work so I could be there <laughs> every I time I've got something else I have to do and it's, geez I, I have been participating with Trevor at Emerson and it should be because we should be with the technology we have today we should be using it to, to, to connect to to collaborate to build a, a network of educators across well Greg I'm not with Emerson country. anymore oh you're not <laughs> No, no. Oh, oh. I'm with, yeah, there you go. So I'm with, uh, I started my own business, Refrigeration Mentor. So I'm okay. in my own refrigeration training business. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, and this is a, just another initiative, you know, uh, to help educate the industry. So we're getting into, uh, it's great to have you. I know I was talking with uh, Sean Spencer and he says he's uh, teaching out in New Brunswick now. Yes, he is. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's pretty awesome to have him there. So yeah, he's on our team here at the college. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, he's uh, he's a great resource to have um, on the team because he's so so has so much knowledge to share. So so back in, yeah, go ahead. You're 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 in in still in in Brantford. Yeah, still in Brantford. Still uh, still uh, yeah in Brantford running my business. Uh, out of my office here, I got a nice studio I, I built, and now I'm just uh, training contractors all over North America right now. So it's pretty awesome, and it's growing, right? So started five months ago, and it's uh, doing initiatives like this is fantastic for me. I got uh, lots of uh, uh, opportunities to share my knowledge, and that's what this is all about. Morning coffees with Trevor. Okay. Yeah. Cool. We'll get back into overheating. So that compression ratio, you know, you start to, that compression ratio starts to grow 
And as it grows, it, or sorry, it uh, gets bigger or wider, um, you do more work and more heat. And what that leads to is higher discharge temperatures, right? And when you start to lead to higher discharge temperatures, you can potentially start to break down the oil, lose lubrication, and then which leads to damaging the compressors. And it doesn't matter if it's semi-hermetic, if it's scroll or hermetic, it's something that you need to look at. And uh, how you check compression ratio is you need to take the absolute discharge over the absolute suction. And if you want to get absolute, you need to add atmospheric pressure, which is 14.7. But what I tell all the technicians is that, you know, make it easy, do 15. You have calculators, you can really do it in your head. So if you get like 275 PSIG, you know, you add uh, 15 PSI, that's 290 PSIG. So that's your absolute discharge. And then when you get your suction, if it's 55 PSIG, you add 15 PSIG. So atmosphere will be 14.7 by 15. So that's 70 PSI A for their suction. And then you would divide those. So 290 PSI A over 270 PSA, it's like four to one compression ratio. So that's probably in the range. But when you start to get high compression ratio, that's more like the air, like maybe an air conditioning compression ratio. But low temp, you're going to have way bigger compression ratio. You know, you're going to have 10, 15, even up to 20 uh, compression ratio, 20 to one compression ratio. And if you're in metric units, you'd be in bar. So it'll be, you'd add one bar to it. So the, I know there's some people overseas listening. And uh, I think uh, that was kind of one of the things that I learned when I went and travel overseas. I was using PSI. I'm always used to Fahrenheit. And then uh, all of a sudden I had to learn how to use bar and Celsius. So it's a... Uh, in the trade, there's so much different things to learn. Whatever. Trevor, yeah. With respect to compression ratios, and this debate always comes up, what are the limits of the different types of compressors with respect to the maximum compression ratios that they can operate at before we have a problem? And I know, oh. you know, reciprocating versus scroll versus rotary versus screw. Yeah. So so they're, they're all different. And yeah. what you need numbers. to do... So, well, I can't just give you numbers because what you need to do is go into the performance chart of the compressor and mm -hmm. what is the maximum you can do. So if you go into performance chart, so your maximum, just say it's 140 uh, condensing and say it's 45 evaporating. That's the maximum you could do. And then the lowest end maybe is 60 condensing and minus uh, 25 so that would be the maximum compression ratio. You want to stay inside that operation envelope. Okay. Could they go higher? Like scrolls, for an example, you have um, a compression ratio for air conditioning where that floating seal would unseat is 11 to 1. So anything below 11 to 1, that compressor is not going to unseat. But it doesn't mean you're not outside, running outside the, the compressor uh, operation limits. So I would always look at that compressor manufacturer's envelope. Mm -hmm. And make sure that you're staying inside that because if you're not, that's when you start to get outside. And what's great about the big leading manufacturers, they design the envelopes uh, conservatively. So if you're running around borderline on there, the compressor is still going to last a long time, but they're not going to last if you start running outside, setting the low pressure control incorrectly, uh, not doing maintenance. Um, and you run outside that it's not going to last at 15, 20 years. The compressor should last. If that makes sense. One of the biggest checks for overheat that you need to do as a technician or you need to get ingrained in you, because I didn't do this for many, many years, is you need to get that discharge temperature checked. And it doesn't matter what compressor you were working on, any heat in the system is going to be, you're going to see it coming out the discharge. The hottest point in any compressor is right when that compression is finished. That stroke of that cylinder when it leaves that valve or right when it's squished, that last a piece of um, refrigerant being squished, that's going to be the hottest point. And so when you measure it on the discharge line, say on a semi-hermetic or a scroll or a hermetic, that's going to give you an idea of how warm your system's running. How hot is that refrigerant in there? How, how high is that, um, that the heat of compression, right? Because you're taking the motor heat, you're taking the system heat, the, the, uh, the refrigerant that pulls the, the heat out of the people or the product that's going all the way back to the compressor. You're getting it compressed again. 
and you're checking that discharge line temperature. And it's so important, you know, do it about five, depending on the compressor manufacturers, they're going to say it could be five, five inches, like on scroll compressors, if it's um, with um, service valve, I think it's five inches without it's six or seven, but it doesn't matter. If you do it at six inches, check it right there. It's going to give you what that specific point is, that temperature, but it's going to be hotter inside that compressor. So like semi-hermetics, if you get around 225, you know that it's going to be 50, maybe to 75 degrees hotter inside the, the head of that compressor. Okay, where scrolls now, it's going to be a little bit uh, less. So if you get, you, you'll see, um, depending on the model of the scroll compressor, it's going to depending on how hot um, the DLT would be, or sorry, the discharge line temperature protector uh, will trip out. Some will be 240, some will be 260, some will be 290. Um, so it depends on the compressor. But when you start running, definitely if you're running 250 on a, a semi hermetics 275, 300, if you're getting 300, uh, your oil is breaking down. It's losing lubrication and it's going to, what's going to happen, and you're going to get. Uh, you're not going to have that oil seal. It's going to, you're going to lose that oil seal because what oil does in your, any engine, anything that you're lubricating everything and it, it keeps seals, but it seals up the, all the components and the rings and stuff. When you get that high, it starts to break that down and you get metal on metal and then you don't get that back. Like, even if you stop the, the overheating after the damage is done, it's not, you can't fix that. So in semi-hermetics, you can, you'll start getting blow by for an example and no different even in scrolls you start getting blow by as well like uh, between the flanks you know because if you have damaged a scroll set um because in between the scrolls you should always have uh, the mating surface they call it and it's um it should always have uh, oil in there so it's just a foam of oil as it, the refrigerant goes through and keeps it lubricated but if you overheat that that oil too much where it's not lubricating you'll get metal on metal and it'll cause damage uh, other things to look out for, especially for overheat, is the suction line uh, insulation. And I've seen this many times, and I walk by it so many times, is where, like, I looked at it, oh, there's insulation on it, but it's, like, broken, or it's degraded, or it's bad, or it's ripped or something. If that suction line, say it's outside, for, uh, for example, you've got a condensing unit outside, and it's in the middle of the, it's in the middle of the summer, and you get the sun beating down, all that heat is going to be taken from the suction line if you don't have insulation it's going to go in through the compressor or if you have the suction running through like a hot attic that's another one where the insulation may be breaking down you might have to change that insulation and it's a pain and it's expensive but that will lead to overheating of the compressor so you go and you you have a failed compressor you need to inspect it you determine okay it was overheat you okay you, you get a dirty condenser, we'll say you clean the condenser and you, oh, I believe it was a condenser, but you don't check the insulation. You put a new compressor in and you have hot gas coming back to that compressor, high return gas temperature, high suction temperatures because of heat being picked up through a hot attic, through, um, through you know, being outdoors and high ambient. And that's why you need to do that discharge temperature check, discharge uh, line check. Because if you don't, uh, you don't know how hot that system is running. Um, and then when you get to low temp applications, you need to check with the compressor manufacturers and the operating of, well, do I need a head cooling fan? Do I need liquid injection or a temperature response device that will send liquid refrigerant into the suction or into the compressor, but it's actually flashed. It's not, you're not putting liquid in there. It's flashing it in there and it's boiling off and cooling down the compressor. So when the compressor gets to a certain temperature, it will open up a solenoid, it'll open up a valve, it all depends on the, the manufacturer. It could be a, a cap tube, it could be a, a DTC, it could be a TREV, temperature response valve. And what it will do, it'll add additional cooling. But you need to go into the manuals of these compressor manufacturers and find that out. You need to, and depending on the refrigerant, you may need a head cooling fan for one refrigerant, and may not for another. And I've seen this uh, many times with doing a gas retrofit. So a uh, retrofit going from uh, say 404 to 448, 449, whatever, they're gonna run a bit hotter. 
you know, it doesn't like the new, those refrigerants, 448, 449, don't run as hot as R22 did for low temp, but they run 10404. So you need to get into the operation envelope at that specific compressor manufacturer. Do I need to add demand cooling? Do I need to add liquid injection? And so on and so forth, because if you're not, you're going to overheat. Another big one that I seen that was that's missed is low pressure control. I didn't know how to set a low pressure control up. Uh, I was always told low temp, you know, two to five psi, you know, medium temp, ten to fifteen psi, you're good. But I, when I worked for the compressor manufacturer and I found out about these comp, uh, compression ratio, operation envelopes, performance charts, you could set if you set that low pressure control to two psi in a low temp compressor, potentially that that low temp compressor only goes down to ten psi but you're pumping it down to two. Can you go outside the envelope a little bit? For sure you can. You can go out if you're, if you're set, uh, your low pressure control down to two PSI just to do a pump down. And that pump down only happens a few times a, a day, maybe a, a, a couple times a day. Okay, you're outside the envelope for a pump down. So, okay, you're doing a little bit more work than you need to, right? And you always need to make sure that you get all that liquid out of your evaporator when you're doing a pump down on a refrigeration system. So you don't want it to short cycle because that's gonna cause you uh, issues as well, pumping out all your oil, which could lead to many other issues. Um, but if you're running outside there, so just say you're just running your, your compressor and your pump down takes a long time to do a pump down because maybe you have a big suction line or maybe your solenoid is put far away from the TX valve because now you got to empty that whole liquid line. That's called an evaporator. That'll be like the evaporator if you put your TX way far away from your um, evaporator and or your solenoid and then you got to get all that liquid through so it's going to run and run and run and run and run and you could be running outside the envelope of that compressor for that whole time so that's just something that you want to be aware of um, for overheat and it's easy to tell the signs of that when you see overheat you usually can look at the compressor and you get the stickers peeling off it looks brown or black um, and it's it's something that you need to take the time to look into um, we need more and more technicians out there to inspect these compressors because I, I, I changed valve plates. I changed compressors. I never looked into a scroll when I was in the field and I've over the years. Uh, and even now I talk to technicians, you know, you don't have time on the job to do it. You know, you're, you're paid, uh, either per job. Like if you're, you're doing a replacement, it could be a, you got four or eight hours to do a job or you're doing, uh, a job that you need to get up and running. You have $100,000 uh, worth of food that's it's getting warm. You need to fix that right away. But take that compressor and bring it back to your shop or even bring it back to your home and inspect it so you'll learn. You're not going to do this all the time, but when you start to do this as a technician, you're going to learn more and more about what makes a compressor tick. Any questions from anybody? Well, that's all right. That's all right. Yeah, so it's important to, to look at that stuff because um, when you're not checking it, you walk by and you just leave it at that, it's, uh, that, that those compressors aren't going to last as long. And overheat is something that compressor manufacturers are starting to get, and system manufacturers, I should say, starting to get uh, a handle of because there's more protection in systems. Like uh, a lot of manufacturers will add a discharge um, temperature protector. So it'll trip off the compressor, open the contact if you uh, reach above a certain temperature, it clicks on. And, or like uh, Copeland have uh, developed uh, core sense modules. As, and uh, so if you add that module in Europe, it's, it's cool because you get it with the compressor. In North America, you have to buy this little temperature probe separately for core sense protection, um, but it'll, that's extra protection. Add that for your customer. Like, yes, you may have, you might not get it with the new compressor or the manufacturer or the OEM doesn't put it in, but this is where you can put, bring insurance to your customer and that's bringing value. And then you make some extra money because you can talk to them. If it's not installed on there, you can say, listen, let's do be proactive. I want to install these temperature probes and all your compressors, you know, and you got forties, sixties, let's protect it. And let's, you know, if one of these gets protected, you know, it's going to pay for all of them throughout the whole site for example. And then Bitzer has the IQ module, does the temperature protection on it as well. So it's so important that you look these different 
um, components that can be added to protect against overheat. Because when you can do that, then it's going to save your customer money. You're going to uh, find um, other issues out potentially. And when you get there, because if a compressor is down, a box is warming up, you can take the time to go and inspect, okay, well, I know it tripped on um, discharge temperature. I put a lockout relay in uh, to the, the discharge temperature probe. I know it was discharge temperature. Now, what caused it? Was it the condenser? Is it non-condensables in the system? What is it? You know what I mean? And go through the process. Is it the suction line getting too, too, um, too much gas? Is it um, a plug uh, filter dryer, suction filter dryer, and you got a huge pressure drop? Is that suction filter dryer, should it be removed? You know, what's the pressure drop? So it's important to look at that stuff. Any questions from anyone? I've been talking a lot here, a little too much. We could listen to you all day, Trevor. Mm. Thank so you, Aaron. Like, I appreciate I, that. We know what it's like when you're talking all day and nobody's talking back. It's like we're <laughs> teaching online. It's like, okay, what do you guys think of this now? Is it A or B? Silence. It's like yeah. they're afraid <laughs> of the microphone or something. Whether well, it's the same in the classroom anyway, but uh yeah, no, no, and that's all good. You know, it's uh if uh if somebody's getting a little bit out of it, I really appreciate that because this is why why we do this stuff, Greg, you know what I mean? And Aaron, it's to really share the knowledge and really help others out. You know, if if I can help someone, you know, help their customer out, you know, I'm doing my job, you know, if they feel a bit more confident and uh, effective at their job, that's really why I started my business is to really build confidence in technicians and companies and contractors. And so, so they go out and feel confident in what they're doing. Because I had, there's many, many years. And I even talked about it with my wife where like, I was super stressed out leaving a job site, not knowing did I fix the problem or not. And I want to really help other technicians not have that feeling. You know what I mean? You're still going to have it. I think that's something that we don't talk about enough. A lot of people like to walk around here. We're leaders in the industry and we like to act like, oh, we're the big know-it-alls and we've been working in the industry for 38 years and we always fix the problem and blah, 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 blah. And we don't talk about the fact that, yeah, back in the day as we were going through it, there was a lack of confidence that almost at the end of everything. Did I do it? Did I get it? What did yeah. I miss? What what knowledge am I missing that I should have had? And then the call that we've all had callbacks. No, oh, yeah, last forever. And we wear it every day. And you know, uh, the stress leads to people. Where do you head on the way home from the last job? Liquor store first, home second, uh, because you're <laughs> you're so fit. We don't talk about these things. The guys are all doing it. They're yeah, all going nah. through it, and they think they're alone. They think they're the only one because we're sweeping it under the rug. So let's talk about it. Let's be honest. I yeah. talk about it in my class all the time. I said I didn't. It didn't go good for me every day. I'll tell you, I had a lot of bad days. Bad yeah. days every day because I was always missing some piece of the puzzle. Because the puzzle's too freaking complex. You can't. You're always missing pieces of the puzzle. So let's talk about it. Yeah. No. And you're so right. And this is because why, like. I talk about it with the technicians as well as like um, you need to, you know, step back sometimes and look like um, if you can't figure something out in, you know, in say you, you go and you get all your checks and all your, your checkpoints, you want to build a network of other technicians oh, yeah. and be able to bounce stuff off them. So you spend a half an hour, you do all your checkpoints, you check the fans, you check the airflow, you check the lights, you check the, the pressures, you check all the temperatures from superheat to subcool and the compressor sub uh, superheat, um, uh, D, uh, T, uh, temperature differences, TDs, you know, you get all that information, you know, you check your voltage, your amps, and then if you can't figure it out, it doesn't take a long time to do all that stuff. Even if it's on a larger system, you write everything down and over time you'll get sequences and then you bounce that off of another technician and they, they may not have the answer either, but it's going to help you be like, okay, I don't know it, uh, but I want to figure it out, you know, and then you go at home at the end of the day, not so stressed out because I've, I've been really stressed out at some jobs, especially making mistakes along the way. It's, it's okay to make mistakes in our industry, um, but you got to learn from them. You can't Listen, just keep doing them. I tell my students, it's this simple guys. Okay. When I teach pressure entity and analyzing what's going on in the, in the vapor compression cycle, all you got to do is measure two pressures and four temperatures. Yeah, That's all I, you got to do. Yeah. I need two pressures, 
high and low side. I need evaporator outlet temperature, compressor inlet temperature, compressor outlet temperature, and liquid line temperature. If I measure two pressures and four temperatures and I know my shit, I can figure out exactly what's going on with that system. And that's it. That's all. Yeah, you will definitely have a better idea than spending an hour or two not checking anything. You know what I mean? Because, we, we, you know, in the classroom, we bring out, okay, now we're going to study pressure and enthalpy. And, <gasps> oh, my God, it's going to be hard. All that big chart. And those, that's, guys, it's two pressures and four temperatures done. Yeah. Well, it can be a bit more than that, depending on the system and how big yeah. it is. But... Yeah, but the rest is just knowledge and math. It's yeah. two pressures and four temperatures. That's it. You can't measure two. You can't measure two pressures and four temperatures without getting stressed on you. Yeah, well, it, find the pipe, find yeah, the access fitting, and find the four pipes. It's a, yeah, it's to take the time to do that and learn that, you know. But yeah. if you're not taught that, you don't know. So I want to thank everybody for joining today. Hopefully, you learned one or two things. Uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be here again with uh, morning coffees with Trevor. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. My email address Trevor at uh, refrigerationmentor.com, uh, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Everyone have a good day. Cool. Gotta go to work.